The Falcons steal Lions cornerback Jeff Akuda for a fifth round pick. Does this mean that they won't go cornerback in round one of this year's draft? We'll break it down on today's Locked On Falcons. You are Locked On Falcons, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. So guys, you know me, I'm Aaron Freeman, a.k.a. Sirius Black, a.k.a. Mr. Drew, and of course, the very humble host of this illustrious Locked On Falcons podcast, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast, part of Locked On Sports Atlanta, your team every day, and we want to thank everyone that makes Locked On Falcons their first listen each and every day. Make sure you subscribe or follow for free on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts to get the latest episode as soon as it's available. And please rate us. Give us those five stars on your preferred podcast app. So today we are talking all about the surprise trade of Jeff Akuda. Later in the episode, I'll have a guest in Scott Kennedy uh, come on and talk about how this impacts the Falcons' options at the top of the draft. For, for those of you that missed the news on Tuesday, the Falcons traded a fifth-round pick to the Detroit Lions uh, in this upcoming draft for the Lions' former 2020 first-round pick in Jeff Akuda. And anybody who's been a longtime listener of the Locked on Falcons podcast knows I am not necessarily the biggest fan of reclamation projects because usually the players that people are looking to reclaim are people that have name recognition but when you actually watch what they did in the nfl they do not play particularly good football um and you know examples of that over the last year i recall are like jerry tillery and alex leatherwood two former first round picks that people are like oh well we should pick them up no you shouldn't now jeff akuda to me does not qualify as one of those reclamation projects in terms of a guy that played bad football prior to you know his team moving on from him right it was some up and down play i'm certain you know if you're checking out locked on lions or you know any other detroit um you know media or whatever they will talk about jeff akuda being a bust and it's hard to argue against that they drafted him number three overall in the 2020 draft the same draft that the falcons took aj Terrell a little bit later and basically now three years later they're giving him away for basically a fifth round pick and so you could imagine if you use the top five pick on a player and then you're giving him away for a day three pick a couple of years later imagine that scenario with like say kyle pitts or something like that like i don't think you could come away from that conversation acting like oh that player is not a bust but I do think this is an instance, unlike other reclamation projects, where I think there's a legit case that Jeff Akuda could turn things around, that the change of scenery that we always talk about with these reclamation projects is worthwhile for him. I saw Dave Burkett of the Detroit Free Press tweet on Tuesday after the trade that Akuda actually wanted to join the Falcons back in 2020. So that's, you know positives and maybe that inspires him to play well i think the expectation is that this will be a contract year for jeff akuda that will also motivate him we'll talk a little bit more about that later in the episode when we talk about the falcons fifth year options for jeff akuda but akuda's story in detroit is one of injuries and inconsistency his rookie season he struggled as everybody on that detroit lions team did in matt patricia's man heavy scheme missed half of that season with i believe a growing injury then in 2021 tore his achilles in the season opener of that year and i think the hope going forward for the falcons is we've talked about how the achilles injury takes some time for guys to recover usually the better part of a year and a half or so and so that timeline is about where you would expect jeff akuda to be getting back to what he was pre-injury or you know, obviously in Detroit, that wasn't necessarily great football, but the player that we thought he could be. And I think you started to see glimpses of that this past season. It was an up and down year for him in Detroit. From all accounts, he started the season strong. And I did watch some of his early season tape. And I thought he did some good work watching him against Dallas and Minnesota in that Vikings game. He shadowed Jeff Justin Jefferson throughout most of that game. Now, the, the Lions did consistently give him safety help over the top rather than just putting him on an island against Justin Jefferson. But it worked for the Lions because Jefferson wound up having his basically his second least productive game of the season with only three catches for 14 yards. But 
from what I understand, later in the season, we saw more struggles from Akuda. I did watch the Jets game late in the year where Jeff Smith, the uh, Jets, like number six wide receiver going into the season, but due to injuries was elevated further up the depth chart. Put in some work on Akuda in that game, beat him a number of times in that game. And from what I understand, uh, reading some stuff that Akuda struggled again the following week against Carolina and was briefly benched. So I think when we're talking about Jeff Akuda, we're not necessarily talking about a guy that when he was a top five pick or a top three pick as a guy that had the potential to be one of the top corners in the NFL. And we've talked about how the cornerback position, those guys get drafted highly because it's a height, weight, speed position. And Jeff Akuda definitely checks the height, weight and speed uh, boxes. But I think when in terms of what he can be here in Atlanta, if he can, you know, sort of turn things around and that change of scenery benefits him, I think you can still get a high end number two corner. Right now, if that's what Jeff Okuda turns in, then that to me is a high reward, low risk type of move. Obviously, there's no guarantee that he'll turn into that. But I think the bad version of him is kind of a lot like what early career Isaiah Oliver was during his early days in Atlanta. He's a big, long, physical corner, not the fastest guy in the world. And when his awareness and his technique are not necessarily locked in, you will see him get worked as we saw with Oliver early in his career. And as I saw in a couple of these games, like the Jets game as well. So that is something that he's going to have to improve upon. Obviously, this regime, this coaching staff believes that they can improve that with him and so therefore I, I do see this as a low risk high reward type of move we'll see how it all plays out but there is the potential for this to be a steal if Jeff Akuda can turn into that high end number two that will absolutely be a steal you got that in round five I mean that's you know not I'm not saying he's gonna be Richard Sherman but when I think of good fifth round corners Basically, Richard Sherman is the only guy that comes to mind in in my in my book. So that would be a great move for the Falcons to get a quality starter, uh, you know, for a fifth round draft pick. Uh, and so we'll talk about the fifth year option for Jeff Akuda and whether or not the Falcons will exercise it. And we'll also break down how this move potentially impacts the Falcons draft plans as we continue today's Locked on Falcons. Guys, today's episode is brought to you by the Ultimate Football GM, this fun new mobile game that I've talked about before, and there's nothing more satisfying than pulling off a big trade, and you can do that with the Ultimate Football GM and handle every strategic aspect of your team, whether it's making trades, signing free agents, drafting players, hiring and firing coaches and coordinators. The game world is very challenging. It's very realistic, but helping you overcome that challenge is is a 100% free boost to all of our listeners that sign up with the promo code locked on in the game store. That's locked on in all caps. So make sure you check it out today. So if you want to pull off your Terry Fontenot like moves with the Ultimate Football GM, just download the game by going to ultimate gm.com or look it up in your app stores. Again, that's ultimate gm.com, Ultimate Football GM. Start your dynasty today. So I want to, before we talk about the impact of this move on the draft and what do the Falcons do with Jeff Akuda's fifth year option, I do want to thank everyone that is an everydayer, right? All of you guys that make Lockdown Falcons your first listen, or, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll apologize if, if, if you make us your second listen, but you're checking us out every single day on your preferred podcast platform. And please rate and review us on your preferred podcast platform. Five stars, of course, if you want, make sure you subscribe on your preferred podcast platform. But let's talk about the fifth year option for Jeff Akuda, because that is going to be something that the Falcons have to decide to do by the deadline this year, which is May 1st. They have to make a similar decision with A.J. Terrell, who was also a first round pick in that 2020 draft. And for Terrell, the number for him, if the Falcons do decide to exercise that fifth year option, and we certainly think they will, is about twelve point three four four million dollars. And that will keep A.J. Terrell under contract through the 2024 season the fifth year of his contract. And assuming that A.J. Terrell plays at a high level, and this goes back to a conversation I had earlier this offseason with Josh Kendall of The Athletic, I would think the Falcons will try to extend A.J. Terrell after this 2023 season, assuming he has another good year, um, rather than letting it play out on that fifth-year option, right? Um, and so we'll see, similar to what we saw this past offseason with Chris Lindstrom, we could see A.J. Terrell 
a year from now being one of the highest paid corners in the NFL, assuming he plays well. So that fifth year option is, is almost a certainty with AJ Terrell. It's not quite the case with Jeff Akuda. And the, if, the number for him would be about $11.514 million. So about 800 K less than what AJ Terrell is set to make. And that's due to the fact that Akuda has missed time due to uh, those injuries and whatnot. But if it's exercised, this fifth year option for both players would be fully guaranteed at the time of it being exercised. So, you know, let's say the Falcons decide to officially exercise those um, fifth year options, you know, the day after the draft or whatever on April 30th, whenever that is right before the May 1st deadline, those automatically come fully guaranteed for 2024. There's no way the team can get out of it. The only way that you could get out of a fifth year option after exercising it would be to trade the player. And in Akuda's case, you know, that trade is not going to, it's not very realistic because we saw how low his trade value is already with the Falcons getting him for a fifth year round pick. And so in a world where the Falcons basically exercise that fifth year option and be like, no, we don't want to do that. We want to get rid of him at, assuming, you know, in this scenario that he would have a rough 2023 and the Falcons want to get out of that. His trade value will be next to nothing at that point. So that's not realistically an option. So I think for the Falcons, they'll play it safe. They won't exercise uh, Akuda's fifth year option so that will mean that this upcoming 2023 season will be the final year of his contract and he and both Casey Hayward uh will be in contract years this year so to me this basically boils down to like a one year rental for Jeff Akuda the Falcons will have to carry about a 5 million dollar cap hit for Akuda this season uh unless they decide to restructure his contract between now and the start of training camp where he has like a 4 million dollar roster bonus due uh on the I think the third day of training camp so we'll see if that happens but more than likely I think the Falcons will sort of leave his contract as is let him you know see if they can successfully reclaim him and you know see what's what and if he plays well then they will he'll hit the open market and the falcons will probably play him pay him like a starter or whatever if he doesn't then he'll walk and you know the falcons will move on at the cornerback position now one of the options for the falcons to move on to is if they were to select a corner in this upcoming year's draft but i think this move makes it less likely that the falcons will pull the trigger on a cornerback in round one Right. I don't think it completely takes corner off the table at the top of round one, but I think the chances of them taking you know, a cornerback that high in the draft, given that they already have Hayward, they already have Akuda, they have Darren Hall, they added Mike Hughes, they have D. Alford, it does feel like they're pretty much good to go in terms of the high end corners to sort of see what they already have in house. And maybe I think this pushes the idea of taking a cornerback later, another developmental sort of corner that can add some depth round three, round four, or possibly later in the draft to me does make sense for the Falcons. I thought Christian Gonzalez, the Oregon corner was certainly a realistic option for the Falcons at the top of round one. You know, he was sort of the third most likely selection based off of my expectations for the Falcons at the eighth overall pick, depending on the availability of those top two options, which for me were Jalen Carter, the Georgia defensive tackle, Tyree Wilson, the Texas Tech defensive end. Um, but I would imagine uh, uh, Gonzalez now falls further down the list in terms of potential options. The same would go for Devin Witherspoon, the Illinois corner, who I didn't think was necessarily as realistic an option at eight uh, because of the uh, lack of size there for that position. So to me, I think this only increases the odds that the Falcons take a pass rusher at eight. This has been something since the start of free agency that I felt like that was the Falcons intention with that eighth overall draft selection at the top of round one, again, Carter Wilson should be at the top of their board. Now I think Miles Murphy goes from number four option to number three option, the Clemson pass rusher, uh, leapfrogging Christian Gonzalez. And, you know, if we were to round out the top five, I wouldn't put Christian Gonzalez in my top five anymore. That means B. John Robinson, who was previously in the top five in terms of likely Falcons option, goes to four, the Texas running back. And then I'd probably pencil in Northwestern Peter Skaronsky with that fifth option. Um, maybe you might be able to convince me that, you know, there's a world where the Falcons would pull the trigger on a Christian Gonzalez uh, a little bit later. But, you know, I don't think they'll take Will Anderson of Alabama, the pass rusher. I don't think they'll take Nolan Smith of Georgia, another pass rusher, or Lucas Van Ness of Iowa. They are certainly options, but I don't think they're realistic because I don't think Anderson and, and Smith have the size that the Falcons are looking for. And I just don't think Van Ness is going to be rated that high by the Falcons. We'll see if that prediction uh, is wrong or, or right or whatever, but it's based off of the idea that the Falcons tend to go chalk with their early round picks, meaning that they don't typically stray too far from consensus when it comes 
to the available options in the first few rounds of the draft based off of Terry Fontenot's two-year draft history. And I don't think that's going to change in year three. And so me having compiled rankings from 19 different draft boards, when I look at these potential options that we've named, you know, the consensus rankings for these guys on these draft boards, you have Jalen Carter as number three, you have Bijan Robinson as number five, Tyree Wilson's number six, Gonzalez is seven, Skaronsky's eight, Devin Witherspoon is number nine, Murphy is 14, Van Ness is 20, and Nolan Smith is 22. So We'll see what, you know, the updated, the final boards look like over the next couple of weeks, and that may modify things a little bit. But I, I do think the Falcons, this is definitely pushing the Falcons in the direction of taking a pass rusher in round one, and, and this trade today only solidifies that belief. And so we will move on uh, and continue to wrap up today's episode with my guest, Scott Kennedy, uh, and talk more about the potential round one options. Uh, I've recorded this shortly after the Akuda trade. Uh, with Scott and Scott will make the case why cornerback is still technically an option for the Falcons, why B. John Robinson is an option, but potentially a luxury pick as well as which pass rushers he thinks the Falcons could be targeting at eight. And we'll get into that to wrap up today's Locked on Falcons. All right, everyone, you are back here on Locked on Falcons with another illustrious guest. He is Scott Kennedy. He has his own YouTube channel where he posts clips of various prospects, talks Falcons, talks Broncos. You can find his written content at allfalcons.com. Scott, welcome to Locked on Falcons. Well, Aaron, I appreciate you having me on. I had you on uh, last fall. I got you up at, you know, like eight in the morning, mm -hmm. some ungodly hours. So appreciate you doing, uh, trying to trying to pay it back. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. The, you know, I had a couple co cups of coffee for that that episode. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, if any of those were bad takes, blame it on the lack of caffeine uh, from that episode. But Scott's going to be here with us talking a little bit about some of the prospects that he likes in this draft for the Atlanta Falcons at various points in the draft. But, you know, let's be transparent here. And we're recording this only minutes after the Falcons traded for Jeff Akuda. So, Scott, now that I have you here. Let's uh, talk about how that trade potentially impacts the Falcons draft in, in this football team. Yeah, that's the news, isn't it? Now, it seems like sending a fifth rounder for Akuda on the surface, that looks like a great deal for the Falcons. On the surface, it also looks like that takes cornerback off the board at number eight. Now, I could argue if we were doing a debate and you took one side, I took the other. I could argue that it doesn't take cornerback off the board at eight, but I wouldn't feel really good about it. I would think that the Falcons are moving in a different direction. Frankly, I've liked edge better than corner. I think those are the two biggest needs on this team right now. I've liked edge anyway, hoping that one of those guys, Tyree Wilson, maybe falls to that spot at number eight. But now you're looking at that secondary, and I thought Dean Peace worked wonders with scotch tape and duct tape, putting a, a defense out there with cast-offs from the Titans and, and Bears. And now you're looking at A.J. Terrell, Jesse Bates, Jeff Okuda. You get, hopefully get Hayward coming back healthy. Mike Hughes, Richie Grant in his third year, uh, and then maybe Jalen Hawkins. I feel like I'm even forgetting somebody. That's a pretty deep and talented back seven, let alone what they've done uh, for the front of this defense. So... A lot of the premium resources have gone towards the offensive side of the ball in the first two years of Terry Fontenot's tenure. They, they've made up for it this offseason, Aaron. Yeah, I, I would agree with you there. And I, I would agree with you. Yeah, I think cornerback is not you know completely dead at eight, but you would feel like this is double dipping if they were to pull the trigger on a cornerback there with someone like Christian Gonzalez. Obviously has the long-term potential over a Jeff Okuda. But it just feels like you kind of already have an option there that pushes it to where later in the draft, maybe you feel good addressing cornerback. And the, particularly with this draft class, given the depth of this cornerback class, um, it seems to make a little bit sense to kind of wait on that cornerback position. Yeah, yeah my argument for would be, OK, you got A.J. Terrell. He's going to be a Falcon for a long time, hopefully. Uh, I, I expect them to pick up his option. They'll try and sign him to extension. Arthur Blank has never had trouble spending the money. It's spending the money wisely that the people that are in charge have been the problem. So keeping those guys long-term Falcons should be okay. So write him in there. Casey Hayward's old. He's he does, he's he's going to be gone soon. Mike Hughes has kind of been cast around a little bit. We're not really sure what we're going to get long-term there. Jeff Okuda, to this point, has been a bust at number three. Getting him for a fifth is good business. 
but a bust at number three who is on his fifth year option that the Falcons haven't necessarily picked up. So if I'm looking long term, I feel like the only one spot I still have filled is AJ Terrell. So that would be my argument for taking, keeping cornerback on the board. If you really, really liked someone better than everybody else, you could still do it. I just think it's a lot, a lot less likely to happen now. Yeah, I would agree with that. So speaking of options at eight, um, let's talk about some of those alternative options that the Falcons now have, especially if we're kind of pushing cornerback to the wayside. Uh, I'll give you the floor, Scott. Who are, who are some of the guys that you're eyeing for that spot? Well, I tell you, I, I feel like PFF, they're the simulator I use the most, has Tyree Wilson right there about that seven and nine spot, and he's always available when I pick, and I always take him. Um, that to me is, when we're, we're talking about a 270 plus, 275 plus pound edge with athleticism, when's the last time the Falcons could roll somebody out like that? Patrick Kearney, maybe, you know, um, it, it's been a while. Jonathan Abraham, it's, it's been a while since they, they've done something like that. And it's, it's tantalizing to me uh, for, for him in that spot. Kind of a sleeper pick. I don't know how much of a sleeper he is anymore. Is also in the same build as Lucas Van Ness. Um, you know, it's just the production hasn't quite been there because he was relatively new to the game. But when we're talking size, athleticism, 270 plus pounds, very similar to Tyree Wilson. And I guess the big question going in, Aaron, is do you think that four quarterbacks – will go in the, in the first seven. Uh, it's starting to look like they will. And if they do, you should have one of Jalen Carter, Will Anderson, Tyree Wilson, Christian Gonzalez available. One of those four should be available. I'd probably take who's there. If, if, it's, if the, the other if four quarterbacks and then three of those four go, I would probably take one of those four guys at, at number eight. Yeah. yeah um, I, I tend to lean – we will see four quarterbacks go in the top seven. It's never happened before in mm -hmm. NFL history. And so for that reason, you know, me being a natural skeptic, you, you there, there's where your skepticism like, but I think unlike previous years, this draft class, I don't know if is as top heavy as we've seen in previous, like you go back to the 2021 class where there was thoughts that we could have quarterbacks go one, two, three, four in that draft, similar to what I think a lot of people think could happen in this draft, especially if certain teams straight up. But I think last that year in 2021, when you look at the, you know, where where the Falcons didn't take Justin Fields at four to, to make that the case and he falls to 11, you look at the players that went, <laughs> you know, between that pick, Kyle Pitts, uh, Jamar Chase, Jalen Waddle, Penny Sewell, uh, Devontae Smith, J.C. Horn, Patrick Sertan. Michael Parsons. Yeah. And you look at some of those premium players at premium positions I don't know if you really have more than a couple of those guys in this year's draft that are comparable to that to make teams be like, we don't necessarily need a quarterback. And so let's take the, the, the true blue blue chip prospect at another premium position. And we'll feel good about that. I don't know if this draft class has that. So it does to me, make it that something unprecedented, like seeing four quarterbacks go in the top seven is more likely this year. Yeah. Yeah, that was a special draft where I came out of that one saying if you're in the top 12, top 13 or so, you're either going to get a really exciting player or your quarterback of the future, in theory. You know, it's always a crapshoot. Justin Fields should have gone number two overall. I will go to my grave saying that. I would have taken Trevor Lawrence. I would have taken Justin Fields, one and two. And I still think the Falcons should have taken him. God bless Kyle Pitts, but they had no use for a pass catcher with that offensive line and quarterback questions two years ago. Now you're in year three of Kyle Pitts's contract and you're still not quite sure what you've got a quarterback. That was, it could work out. It worked out for the offensive line. Um, you know, the offensive line made a humongous step forward last year, but this year with the Falcons able to really rebuild their team in earnest, Aaron, I hate the phrase best player available because it's it's a contradiction in terms. There's no way you are going to get the best player that is available. It's just there's too many guys behind you. One of these guys behind you, I promise you, is going to be better. There's only one best player. And so I've started saying best prospect available, but if they really do go that direction, and I'm going to trigger you on this one, is B. John Robinson could be a possibility at number eight. Uh, at the running back position, if we're talking truly the best player, he might be the best player in the whole dang draft, Aaron. Not going to get any argument from me on that one, Scott. <laughs> I wouldn't advocate for that. 
Um, and the reason why I've said is because you don't need to spend a top 10 pick. You don't need to spend a premium resource on a running back in order to have a premium running game with this team. Uh, you've put money into the offensive line. You've got an offensive mind and coach. You've got a quarterback who can run and keep things off. You've got a fifth round pick. You're just at the Falcons franchise record. You've seen guys come in. Well, it's Caleb Huntley or, or Cordero Patterson. Uh, Tyler Algier come in and off, you know, the fifth round was inactive the game one and runs for 1200 yards. I don't need to spend a number eight on a player like Bijan Robinson in order to have a plus running game. I'd rather use that somewhere else. Yeah, I would agree with that. But I think the same logic that we just discussed about the lack of premium talent elsewhere in this draft does make taking a player like Bijan Robinson much more of a possibility than I think traditionally we would think given what you just laid out. Is that fair? Yeah, it is. And I kind of said he's a bit of a luxury pick, you know, for a team. It's like if I'm the Philadelphia Eagles or I'm the Buffalo Bills and I'm like one player away and it's a, a guy I'm going to give the ball to 30 times a game, then yes, then, then it makes a lot of sense. I'm not sure the Falcons are there yet. Um, not with the big question they have at quarterback. And there's still a lot of moving pieces on this defense. They brought in a lot of players. How quickly do they all come together and play at that type of level, Aaron? I mean, we're, we're playing Madden here and we're playing fantasy football and the, the team has greatly improved on that side of the ball, but how quickly can it really all come together with, with all these new faces? So this seems still a year away from me with, for, you know, for truly being a contender and, and, and assuming that the quarterback position goes in the right direction. I think they're still a year away. I think Dijon's a little bit of a luxury that I would look for. I need pass rush, man. I can run the ball already. I've got to get, I've got to either give the guys longer to get to the passer or I've got to get to the passer quicker. That has to happen coming out of this draft. I agree. I agree. So guys, I want to thank Scott Kennedy for joining me on today's episode. He will be back to talk more about, you know, some day two options uh, at a future date. Uh, don't know exactly when the second part of our conversation will air on the podcast. I have a lot of content coming out over the next couple of days. Still have a lot of content to air from the conversation I have with Mark Schofield. We still haven't aired the CJ Stroud and Anthony Richardson tidbits, uh, as well as some of the other quarterbacks. So that is potentially in de on deck for tomorrow's episode. We'll maybe uh, continue to break down Jeff Akuda. Uh, we'll see if I can get Matt Derry of Locked On Lions to give his thoughts on Akuda's three-year uh, stint in Detroit later this week as well. So lots of great content coming your way here on Lockdown Falcons. Continue to make us your first listen. And guys, why not check out Locked On NFL Scouting with the Draft Dudes as your second listen where Kyle Krabs, Joe Marino are breaking down all the things that it takes to build a successful NFL franchise, free and available on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. It's all part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team, every 